Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Constellation Theater. For those I've not met, my name is Andy. I'm the cruise director on board, and I have to tell you, number one, first of all, thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. I know this is a little bit out of the norm. When we sail up in the Baltic, because everybody's all ready to go to St. Petersburg, then on embarkation night, we do that first talk so that they can really get as much extra information, and, uh, and I think we get the energy going for that visit to Russia. I feel just the same here. So many of us probably came on this cruise. One of the big reasons was to go to Havana and to see Cuba. And then, I, and of course, absolutely, I'm excited. This is my first time. And of course, we've got Key West coming up. And one thing that Regent has done, I think from the very beginning, was to make sure that we can well, enhance your experience. Bring as much to it as we possibly can. And with that, we've done a wonderful enrichment lecture series for years, and our guests tell us over and over how valuable that is to them. So I thought, first day in Key West, we stay till 11 o'clock. The next day, all of a sudden, we're in Havana, where we'll be staying until midnight. Oh my goodness, we've got to get that first lecture in so we can all uh, be ready for this experience even more than we've been planning. So, without any further ado from me, ladies and gentlemen, our enrichment lecture for tonight as well as for the rest of the cruise, would you please welcome Captain Richard Heyman. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, good evening. Oh, it's my pleasure to see so many of you awake so far. And if I start snoring while I'm talking, well, you... You can sing along that way, but uh, as Andy said, this is a, a special trip because um, most of us have never been to Cuba before. Um, I have to say, I have n neither been there myself, which uh, means I've been studying as much as I can, but I have an uh, active uh, U.S. Coast Guard Merchant Marine Officer's license, and I am not allowed to go on my own. I can come as part of the people-to-people -people exchange that we are here tonight and, and the next few days. Uh, and then we have all these other beautiful places to visit, but uh, uh, it's my pleasure to be on the ship and to get to know you. And, and I can't, I, my wife is working teaching, but I brought my friend Peter Fleischer. Hey, stand up here. I just want to let, him, let people know. I have a, a, a great friend of mine for many years who's an adventurer, a fellow member of the Explorers Club, and also, uh, uh, well, we'll see if he makes it through Havana and gets back to the ship. Because uh, uh, Havana has, uh, let's say, a... Uh, many a legend to it, and it's, uh, uh, it's a remarkable place, and I can say that because I've never been there. Um, many, not too many years ago, I was called from uh, some colleagues and friends who said, well, you charter a ship and go to what's called the Jardín de la Reina, the beautiful coral reef and archipelago on the south coast of Cuba. And uh, I said, well, yes, I'll arrange this for the family. We'll get a vessel that'll go sailing and we'll go snorkeling and scuba diving and all that. And so I, I called various people and I ended up booking the ship, uh, maybe a 50, 60 foot catamaran with plenty of accommodations via uh, Madrid. And then as we were going down and say, well, where's the, where's the vessel? What do we do? And all that. And they said, by the way, are you an American? I said, well, yes. And uh, are you ready to pay the fine, which is $15,000 if you break the embargo. And so I let my friends go on their own. And I didn't, I was not allowed to do it. I'd lose my Coast Guard license and I'd be out of my professional license. So I've waited for years to come like this just to go visit Havana, even just for a brief day. But it's a big place with many things to see and uh, there's a lot of literature and history about it. I'll give you a very brief overview of a lot of it. I imagine some of you were in Cuba or have been or imagined yourself being there. So. Uh, we'll, we'll have plenty of time together to talk about what you saw or what you think about it because it's, as someone said, Cuba is a place where you want to embrace it but then it th throws you back and you, you love it but it also hates you and, and so it's sort of like this tempestuous relationship but particularly between the United States and Cuba. Uh, but uh, that's just politics. Meanwhile, life goes on, let's say. And of course, we're going to Key West uh, which is uh, many of you, I'm sure, have been there, and that's a very special place on its own. So I'll show you a bit about that, and I'll show you a bit about Cuba, and then, and then we'll find out for ourselves how it really is. But meanwhile, um, of course, this is the, uh, the great lineup of old cars, uh, which are a, a curious uh, byproduct of the embargo, because no cars have been allowed to be imported since the, uh, about 1960, and therefore no parts, and so 
the Cubans have managed to keep these classic cars going. And I know there's an excursion where you can you know, rent one and go around town. So that's one of the, the uh, romances of Havana and Cuba in general. But before we get there, we're going to Key West, which is at the end of the Florida Keys. We are now off of Key Largo. We're slowly steaming our way to the south and to the west to go to the end of the Keys. This is Monroe County, um, Florida, which of course was named after uh, the President Monroe and his, uh, I call it a manifest destination to go to Monroe County and Key West. You may have gone out on the causeway and been all the way out there. This is the, the tip of Florida, and it's a very uh, island uh, culture with the town of Key West, which, which has about 30,000 residents. It's not a very big place now. A hundred years ago, though, it was the biggest city in Florida because it had all this trade with Cuba. And it was the U.S. naval base and port of entry and customs and all that. And so uh, it's been restricted by its size ever since, whereas the rest of Florida, of course, has turned into something we just passed through. But for ships to get into Key West, it's very tricky because there are a lot of shoals and canals to get in. The big Navy base that's uh, uh, over on the right side, that come in, that's also Navy base. But there's a lot of neighborhoods that have been built on uh, landfill. So about half of the town has actually been filled in to raise the land enough to live there. So you may have been there. It, you end up in the causeway coming right into town, and the old town is on the very, very tip of it, the, the, the southernmost part of the United States, they call it, other than Hawaii, of course. And so there's a a very strong consciousness that this little place, Key West, is its own world unto itself because it traditionally welcomed refugees, immigrants, pirates, and occasional customs officials and occasional government, but not they don't really like that too much. And they declared themselves the Conch Republic back in the 1990s because, because of the Cuban Muriel boat lift immigration, they, they blocked Route 1 and they checked every car going in, and the, some of the residents of Key West were so angry, they declared their independence. Well, it's only for happy hour. It's not really independent. But uh, you can see that the conch is the symbol of the town, and this comes from traditionally when there was a baby in a house, they would take a shell and put it on a pole saying, we have a new little uh, uh, spritling in the town. So that's the symbol of the town. And it is the southernmost part and famously 90 miles from Cuba. So Key West and Cuba have been so involved with each other that this is the, uh, the role of history that these two points across the sea, only 90 sea miles away, are very licked in many ways. Originally, it was a, had a uh, kind of a Seminole Native American community who were naturally boat people living on the islands, fishing, had little huts and such. The Spanish came then in 1762, the British came in and took it from the Spanish, and they, they sold all of the natives to the plantations in Cuba, and they became slaves, which is, of course, the great trouble of the Americas. Then the Key West lived off of uh, what they call salvage, meaning ships would come in, break up on the reefs, they would unload things, and so between the uh, nautical wrecks and the uh, let the pirates, it was always a, somewhat of a notorious place at the very end of, uh, let's say, out of the law. Then the U.S. Navy came in and decided to make this what they call the Gibraltar of the West. So they built a big Navy base, even going back to 1832. My distant ancestor, Commodore Matthew Perry, came in and took it from the Spanish and established a Navy base. And then they tried to control the piracy and control the trade more. But there were all kinds of uh, islands and bayous and ways and places, but Key West became the key center for the Navy and the federal government control of this part of the Caribbean. Um, then the town grew on that, and it spread out over the mangroves and the swamps and built up landfill to make the town that we know now. Uh, so it was always a shipping center, but during the Civil War, um, even though Florida seceded, the Navy and then the troops garrison there at, this is Fort Zachary Taylor, kept it as a Union stronghold that then would be the staging base for the blockade of the southern ports. And that's just the bad history of the time. But the forts are still there, these tremendous constructions that were put up 
mainly to keep the, either the British or the Spanish out, essentially. But now they're all national park, and you go out, this is Zachary Taylor just off of Key West. There's an, a larger fort um, further out on the dry Tortugas. So this is the remains of when uh, the Caribbean was much disputed. All the islands were going, all the places were going. I'll tell you more stories about all these countries that have been kicked around by invaders and in empires and then independence and re revolution. But for Florida, the main thing that made Key West and the, the Keys and, and actually Miami area, the whole thing was the great Flagler uh, Florida East Coast Railroad that built this tremendous causeway that came all the way to Key, Key West. Uh, it was subsidized partly by the U.S. government because they wanted to bring in supplies to, for the, the Navy base and make sure that it was um, connected to the mainland. And so Key West always had a fairly prosperous uh, economy. Uh, as I said, it was bigger than Miami a hundred years ago. But it's mostly intact as it was in those days still to this day. It doesn't have large development. It does have docks for the Navy and more hotels and different facilities, and it's a, a modern place. But it, it, because it doesn't have much land, it doesn't, can't really grow, and they have uh, restrictions on building high condos like you see in other parts of Florida or, or other places. This was in World War II, and it was the main training center for the sea planes for the Navy. They had Air Corps to watch for German submarines, and so this was a critical uh, military base. And then when it came down to the Cuban Missile Crisis, then it was right in the front line of a, what could have been a terrible conflict. This is President Kennedy in October 1963 visiting Key West to check on the Nike missile bases. Now, I'll, I'll retreat here uh, to say that my father was a career U.S. Army officer, and he was uh, stationed at the Pentagon, and he went to uh, Houston in full dress, and he was on a commercial flight, and he was hijacked to Havana back in about 1965, and I was a tiny little kid, and he was taken off and interrogated and imprisoned by the Cuban authorities. Uh, but because he had a U.S. Army uniform, they gave him tropical shirts and shorts, and they imprisoned him in the Tropicana Hotel and Resort. And so this made the news at the time. When, when he was finally released after a couple of weeks, he came back to Virginia, where we were living, and uh, you know we greeted him, and, and my mother said, oh, how did the Cubans treat you, and how was the prison? He said, oh, it was okay. <laughs> he had the biggest smile on his face of any... Anybody let out of jail? Anyway, that's, that's just, uh, he got to go there. I haven't had that courtesy yet. Now, pardon me. Then, and, and as Key West, where it is, became the major point for what was called the Muriel boat lift, where Cuban government emptied its prisons and its mental hospitals and sent them all on boats to Florida, which many of them still remain. But that was the kind of tension that has been there in Key West and the problem of this whole area. Uh, in history, many Cuban radicals, revolutionaries, have come to Key West and to, particularly to Tampa to be away from the Spanish government and then the Batista government. So there's a great deal of Cuban um, culture and Spanish-speaking in Key West, though it's not far, but it's a little removed. And they still have the schooners and the fishing, and now it's mostly recreational, a tourism center. Uh, the smuggling is mostly online these days, so I've been told. But they have these beautiful neighborhoods with uh, bungalow kind of houses with great porticos and uh, shaded trees. And so this was actually uh, President Truman's uh, winter White House. He went down there some 100 times over his time. And then others, uh, Roosevelt and many others, have uh, had some winter time there. Uh, but most famously, they had a lot of writers, uh, Ernest Hemingway and... Uh, uh, Tennessee Williams and a lot of literary people have ended up going there to write. Uh, this one uh, has the pineapple of hospitality on one of the old houses. This was um, Ernest Hemingway's house before he then moved to Havana. So he's sort of the local literary line in the place. His grounds are now a national historic park and the one thing they've allowed is the his own cats have been allowed to stay there, and they had this curious thing of having six or seven toes, and they got a city exemption to allow more than four cats in a house, but they are there lounging around on their uh, 
their, uh, the comfort that they've been provided. But meanwhile, the city is very low, and it is subject to flooding. Hurricanes come and wash it out. And so, like in New Orleans, you have all of this uh, cemeteries or the crypts are above ground because this is what uh, happens all too often. This is uh, Hurricane Wilma a number of years ago. And, but in Florida, those of you from Florida, you're used to a little water in the backyard, I think, right? But you're safer on a ship. Um, this is the old... Navy Mole, they call it, in the old part of Key West, which is now given over the cruise terminal. We will land there right off of Mallory Square, which is where they used to offload all of the sea products and the tobacco and all this stuff. Now it is, a, uh, let's say, restaurants and bars and things like that. The, the pillbox is off of the old USS Maine. But this is what we'll see when we get off the ship, walk through some of the remains of the old warehouses. Some of them are intact and uh, have been restored with uh, different... Uh, restaurants and things. So this is uh, Calle Hueso is the name in Spanish for Key West, which is the old name that the Spanish gave it, it meaning the island of bones, because it was traditionally a burial ground for the original native people. So it's still called that in Spanish. Um, and the, the town for many, many years lived off of sponges and fishing and um, other products, tur turtles, especially sponges. Now they're, they're replaced, of course, by uh, uh, synthetic sponges, but you can still buy a few. They go diving down it, but don't get too many, otherwise you may end up looking like this. And uh, so, you know, Key West has a little bit of a wacky quality with um, some rather exorbitant people. Here's somebody driving around with sponges all over their car, just in case they drive, drive into the deep, I suppose. And then there's big sea fishing. Um, uh, well, there's so many tours that you, there's many things to do in Key West, uh, but they don't catch them this big anymore. These are uh, now uh, protected. But for sailors like myself, the main thing is to do a little bar research. So Key West is famous for these, uh, let's say, head-banging bars where you may wake up on a, on a schooner off to somewhere else, but Sloppy Joe's and uh, Captain Tony's. and So you can continue your um, liquid research ashore if you haven't had enough on the ship already. But uh, that makes it into a bit of a party town. And, uh, you know, they try to keep the lid on. But this is in Captain Tony's where everybody gets to stick their dollar bill or their business card on the ceiling. Anyway, Prohibition was a big idea that didn't really make much of a dent. They did a show of it, but, I mean, Cuba was always bringing in more rum, and this was not the driest part of Florida at the time, though they made a show of it. And back then, they also used to catch a lot of turtles. And right downtown in old Key West, there's a pen houses where they would catch the, bring in the catch, and they keep them live till they ship them out. And uh, this was a major f source of meat for the shore, and also they'd sell them to the ships, and uh, now, of course, they're endangered and very few and protected and all that. But you can go into the old uh, pens where they uh, used to keep them and slaughter them and can them, and now it's overwatched by birds to make sure you don't uh, do anything you shouldn't. But they used to sell turtle burgers there, which is not on the menu anymore. Now they're saving them and protecting the beaches and trying to, you know, re restock the population of mostly Razorback and Leatherhead turtles. And we'll see some when we're out um, diving. I mean, the turtles are all around many of the harbors in the Caribbean nowadays because they're not hunted anymore. Well, anyway, Key West is this sort of place where everybody comes from somewhere else. The old timers are called conks, salt conks, they call them. And then everybody else is a wash ashore from somewhere else. So, uh, you know, it lives on tourism this day, but it's also famously kind of a rather exuberant place where everything is okay that way, but uh, that's just the way it is. It's a happy town, and uh, you know, in contrast to Cuba, which is very much more restricted. So if you've been there, it's a fun place, fantastic, with its motto, forward, together, upward, and onward. Well, that's uh, just to keep up with the uh, rising seas, I suppose. But the Cubans in Key West had their own associations, and they... Um, from the days of Jose Marti and against the Spanish Empire and all this, Key West was a key place for the Cubans to promote their own independence from the Spanish, and they had a sympathetic audience in Florida and the United States. And so a lot of the late 1800s and early 
1900s was a lot of um, smuggling of arms and people back and forth from Key West and into, into Cuba to try to undermine the Spanish Empire. So because it's so close, it really is a, uh, let's say, a reflection of the, the, the much larger place that is Cuba. And back when prohibition was in, in force of the United States, Cuba then became the place to go party with, uh, you take a ship from Miami or Key West or all the way from the, any other port. And so Cuba, particularly in the 30s and the 40s into the 50s, became a notorious, uh, let's say, uh, libertine place. And Key West still has a bit of that. Now, as we sail out, this is past the Navy Station, and then we cross the strait. And I have to remind you that this is actually still an embargoed strait, and the U.S. military is enforcing that, and it's out there patrolling around. And, uh, of course, now they're having us visit anyway. So over this period of history, it's getting better, but slowly. Now, back when it was first discovered by Columbus on its third voyage, this was a great discovery, this very large island. It's almost as big as Florida and has beautiful bays and harbors and mountains in the middle. And so it was considered the pearl of the Caribbean and big enough to be a nation on its own in that way um, compared to all the smaller islands and nearby. So Cuba has had this uh, geography that has meant that it has many districts and many places and then a very contentious society from the time when the, the natives were made to work for the Spanish and plantations and when they all died out they brought in African slaves and so it's been an island of, of let's say, toil and torment for some people to the enrichment of, of others and that's been the, the, the problem of Cuba all along. Nowadays, you have a road network and you have the major city of Havana, which is where some 40% of the population of the whole island live. You have all these other places and there's a lot of back country and a lot of remote places. This is the Oriente, they call it, which is Camagay and Santiago de Cuba are the, the older city than even Havana. And Guantanamo is there on the right in the bay that it is. Um, but there's a lot of little islands. This is the... Uh, if you can see the islands just off the, to the left, that's the extensive coral reef, almost as big as Belize and Honduras where we're going. But it has never been developed. It was made a national park by the uh, Cuban government uh, so, so long ago that it's considered one of the pr m most pristine uh, marine biosphere regions in the Caribbean these days. I'll give a talk just about the Caribbean in a couple of days. But in Interior Cuba is very mountainous, goes up to about 6,000 feet, of, you know, 2,000 meters on some of the peaks. And so the interior is so rugged that that's where, uh, well, people would go hide and take refuge, but particularly Castro and his guerrillas went up into these mountains and they, they couldn't catch them, and then he finally came in and continued the revolution. But it was the geography that gave him cover. So there's a very lush countryside. The soil is very rich. There's tropical... Um, weather so that things grow all year round. Uh, the big cash crop, of course, was tobacco. So this is a, what they call a hivarito uh, uh, house. The, the countryside farmers um, have fairly rich land, but uh, it, between tobacco, sugar, and other food products, that's the basis of the agricultural economy. There's also a lot of wildlife in certain places that are protected, the flamingos and the, pe the pelicans and the crocodiles and the such like this, uh, though the, uh, the, I, I believe they've tried to convince the, uh, the alligators to be vegan these days, just to the courtesy of the swimmers these days. But, but just going back in the, uh, the human history, the, uh, the Chibone people, uh, the, like the Taino and the other Caribbean, Caribe and other na native peoples, left petroglyphs, this is about, about 8,000 years old on the, one of the islands off of Cuba, very curious spirals in, in, in this sort of anthropological study. There's a lot of mystery because these people have actually gone extinct and nobody really knows what any of it means. And then Columbus came. And I, I always like this picture because you can see Columbus in his pensive mood being greeted by a Caribe or Arawak woman in that Caribbean in, invention, the hammock. And she's probably saying, well, you certainly look overdressed for the climate. And by the way, uh, what's for lunch? Oh, you can see up there. 
So this is where the, the, let's say, the great impact happened. And the Spanish came and took Cuba and actually Columbus's uh, agreement with uh, is, uh, Ferdinand and Isabel. His family would be in charge of Cuba as a personal business, and then they would pay tribute to the Spanish emperor. Well, he got thrown out by other intrigue, and then the court in Madrid appointed governors right up to the 1890s. And so the Spanish had a very, let's say, unkindly rule over the island, which is why it's been so conflicted in, in general. But uh, this was the first native rebellion, uh, Hatue, who was sort of a national hero in Cuba. And as he was being burnt at the stake in, uh, in one town, uh, he, a, a priest would say, now you can repent and go to heaven if you convert at this point before we kill you. And his, he answered back, are there many Spanish in heaven? And the priest said, well, of course. And he said, well, I don't want to go there. They're too dangerous. And he was burnt as his fate. Anyway, he doesn't look too happy about the way things worked out. Um, but, you know, Cuba was fought over, over and over again, particularly when the, the, the British and the French came and tried to attack the Spanish main with all the gold and silver they were taking out of Mexico and South America. And the, the Ar Armada ships would come and gather in H Cartagena and then up in, in uh, Havana. And then the, the, the British and the French would come and bombard. And sometimes they were su successful or not. But what the Spanish did is build these incredible fortifications. And you've, you may have been to San Juan, where they, the same thing, the uh, Castillo de Moro, is this tremendous bulk work on the entrance to the harbor. This is right at the eastern side of Havana Harbor and opened as a national park now. But these great forts would keep the prey uh, of the other European nations away and made Havana a most impregnable uh, redoubt of the Spanish Empire. And the, and the, the buildings are still there. They haven't uh, uh, been t taken down and they are one of the patrimonio del país, uh, the, you know, the, the historical quality. This is another fort just to the west of, of Havana, which happens to have the monument to Ernest Hemingway in it, who was, as a writer, he had left Key West, and he went and lived in Havana, and he was a supporter of the revolutionaries in his brief time there, so he's considered uh, a patriot to the uh, Cubans, along with many others. There were so many uh, intrigues of the history of uh, rebellion, essentially, against the Spanish Empire, and of course you remember in the 1820s to the 1840s, every other colony of the Spanish in South America, Mexico, etc., became independent, leaving Cuba as the last bastion of Spanish control in the Americas until the Spanish-American War. And so you, you can go to Cuba in Havana, you can go to the Palacio del Capitan General, where they have a throne room, how, you know, a royalist of them. And they, to the credit of the revolutionaries, they always preserve the old stuff just for educational purposes rather than burning down the palaces and sacking it. Uh, but this is the uh, leftover cannon of the castle, which uh, is a remnant of those conflicted times. But meanwhile, the economy would go on with essentially plantation and slave labor. Uh, up till 1886, they banned slavery finally under international pressure in Cuba, but that legacy goes on to this day of the, of the difficulty 